class and welcome back to our virtual classroom for another AP Psychology unit review. This review video will be all about Unit 6, Developmental Psychology. In this unit review, we are going to start with how our physical development can affect us psychologically. Then we will take a look at how our thought processes change as we age by talking about cognitive and moral development. From there, we will end things off with seeing how our genetics and our environment affect our social and emotional development. Also, don't forget to follow along with your review guide. As always, it'll help you out, I promise. Before we get into all the theories of development, it is important to note some of the major arguments psychologists have in regards to our development. What is going to affect our development more? Is it going to be our genetics, or is it going to be the environment that we're brought up in? As we already know, the nature versus nurture controversy is going to look at just that. Psychologists today generally agree that both nature and nurture play a very important role in development, but today the major debate centers around which one is more influential towards our development. We also have continuity versus stages. This deals with the question of whether or not development is going to be gradual cumulative change from conception to death or a sequence of distinct stages. A lot of the theorists that we talk about in this review are going to be stages. Theorist. Our third and final controversy is going to be stability versus change. This is going to deal with the issue of whether or not personality traits present during infancy last throughout the entire lifespan. Now on to physical development. Physical development is going to focus on maturation and critical periods. Prenatal development begins with fertilization or conception and ends with birth. When an egg is fertilized, it becomes a zygote. A zygote contains all the genetic information necessary for a baby to develop in the womb. After the zygote multiplies again and again and again, it eventually forms into an embryo. After eight weeks, the embryo has a head, partially formed eyes, limbs, and a skeleton composed of cartilage. All organs are present in a rudimentary form, and the developing baby starts to take the form of a human. It is at this stage that we refer to the future baby as a fetus. While in the womb, babies are very susceptible to illnesses the mother has or anything ingested. Teratogens are harmful agents or substances that can cause malformations or defects to the embryo or fetus. A major teratogen, alcohol, can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS, which is a condition in the child that results from alcohol exposure during the mother's pregnancy. FAS can lead to issues with both cognitive and physical development, something that all humankind has in common. We were all born babies. At birth, we are equipped with the basic reflexes that increase the likelihood of our survival. Grasping is when an item is placed in the palm of a baby's hand, the baby will hold on to it. There is a secret baby strength too. Ever give a baby your car keys? Good luck ever getting them back. <laughs> Rooting is going to be the baby's response to turning its head when touched on its cheek, and then trying to put the stimulus into its mouth. Sucking is going to be the automatic response of drawing anything in at the mouth. Both sucking and rooting allow for a baby to stay nourished. As we age, we go through that awkward stage of puberty. Puberty is just going to refer to the stage in adolescence where an individual reaches sexual maturity and becomes physiologically capable of sexual reproduction. The physical changes that occur as a result of puberty fall under two categories. Primary sex characteristics are sex organs that are directly involved in reproduction, while secondary sex characteristics are characteristics that develop during puberty and are not directly involved in reproduction. These traits differentiate between boys and girls. Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget is going to create a stage theory of cognitive development based on decades of careful observation and testing on children. Piaget believed that all knowledge begins with building blocks or schemas, which as you know are mental representations that our brain organize and categorize. Through the process of assimilation, we are able to fit new information into our existing schemas and accommodation allows us to modify our existing schemas to fit new information. Piaget's theory starts us out in the sensory motor stage, which occurs at birth to around age two. It is during this stage that the child will gain an understanding of object permanence. Object permanence is just the idea that an object still exists even though there is no longer any sensory input of that object. If I have a ball and put it behind my back, the baby understands that the ball is still there even though they can't see it. In this stage, the baby also starts to understand basic cause and effect relationships. As our cognition develops with age, we move on to the pre-operational stage, which lasts from roughly around age two to age seven. In this stage, symbolic thought and language development occur. However, our thought process tends to be rather egocentric, where we believe the whole world revolves around us. Ooh. 
Piaget found at this stage children could not solve four conservation problems. Year 7 to 11 bring us to concrete operations, where we now have the cognitive ability to solve conservation problems, and we've developed logical thought and can apply these logical thoughts to concrete problems. At this stage, the child starts to understand the idea of reversibility. An example of this could be how a child understands that 3 plus 2 and 2 plus 3 both provide us with the same outcome of 5. As I mentioned, the child also starts to understand principles behind the idea of conservation. Conservation just refers to a logical thinking ability that allows a person to determine that a certain quality will remain the same despite adjustments of the container, shape, or whatever. In our final stage of Piaget's theory of cognitive development, we have the formal operation stage. The formal operation stage starts in our adolescence and lasts all throughout adulthood. In this stage, we can logically solve all types of problems, think scientifically, and in abstract terms. While influential, Piaget's theory did not go without criticism. One of the few criticisms of Piaget's theory was that it did not study the cognitive changes in adulthood. Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky thought that Piaget underestimated the impact of the social and cultural environment on cognitive development. Vygotsky believed that children were able to attain higher levels of cognitive development through the help and instructions they receive from others. Vygotsky theorized the Zone of Proximal Development, or the ZPD. The Zone of Proximal Development refers to the difference in what children can achieve on their own and what they can achieve with the help of others who are considered more competent. These are people such as parents, your teachers, coaches, or instructors. Scaffolding refers to an instructional method in which the process of problem solving is demonstrated and explained in order to assist a learner who may not be able to achieve success on their own. A more specific area of cognitive development up next, we are going to talk about moral development. Heinz' wife was dying from a particular type of cancer. The doctor said a new drug, discovered by a local chemist, might be able to save her. The only problem was, the chemist was charging an absurd rate for the drug, and Heinz simply couldn't afford it. Heinz went everywhere he could for money, friends, family, but he still could only get enough for half the drug's cost. Heinz pleaded with the chemist, saying he would pay half now and the other half later, but the chemist still refused, saying he discovered the drug so he was going to charge what he saw fit. Heinz was so desperate for the drug that later that night he broke into the chemist's lab and stole the drug. Do you think that Heinz should have stolen the drug? Would it change anything if Heinz did not love his wife? What if the person dying was a stranger? Would it make a difference? Should the police arrest the chemist for murder if the woman were to die? That same scenario and those same questions were presented to a group of 72 young men from Chicago, ranging from the ages of 10 to 16. Now before I go on, I would like to address something that may have just popped into your head. Yes, Kohlberg only using a small sample size from one demographic for his research will lead to some pretty harsh criticisms. But nonetheless, his research still does hold some ground on how our morals develop. The results of this study did provide Kohlberg with the basis for his theory of moral development. Moral development is going to refer to our growth in the abilities to tell right from wrong, control impulses, and act ethically. Like Piaget, Kohlberg is also going to be a stage theorist. Kohlberg's theory is going to be broken down into three distinct levels, each containing two separate stages. Level 1, or the pre-conventional level of morality, states that morals are going to be dictated by the standards of adults and the consequences that follow a rule after being broken. In this level of moral thinking, we are very egocentric, and we base our decisions on what will happen to us directly as a result of our actions. If Heinz were in this stage, he might decide to go and steal the drug because he knows he can get away with it. Heinz sees nothing wrong with stealing another person's property in this scenario, so he is exhibiting pre-conventional moral reasoning. Level 2, or conventional moral reasoning, is where most adolescents and adults reside. In this level of moral development, we follow rules to live up to the expectations of others. We also like to maintain law and order to keep a civilized society. If Heinz were in this stage, he might decide not to steal the drug because he does not want to break the law. Or on the other hand, he might decide to steal the drug in order to be a good husband. Our third and final level of moral development is going to be post-conventional morality. This level of morality states that moral reasoning is going to be based on individual rights and justice. In this stage, we become aware of rules or laws that exist for the good of the people, and we can even see that some laws go against universal moral principles, such as the right to life. As mentioned before, a major criticism of Kohlberg's theory of moral development is the sample that he used for his research. Carol Gilligan is a cognitive psychologist and former student of Kohlberg. 
Gilligan is going to take the basis of Kohlberg's theory and adapt it for women, believing that women follow a different set of moral development. Now let's talk a little bit about social and emotional development. In the mid 20th century, psychologist Harry Harlow researched the idea of attachment using baby monkeys. In his research, Harlow believed that baby monkeys would be attached to caregivers who provided them with nourishment. Harlow tested his theory by showing a baby monkey an aversive stimulus. Harlow then observed to see if the baby monkey would go to a dummy mother that would provide nourishment, known as the wire mother, or if it would go to the dummy mother that would provide comfort, known as the cloth mother. And by dummy mother, I just mean they're not real monkey moms. They're like wire things. You can see in the video. The cloth mother and the wire mother were exactly the same, except for the fact that the wire mother had a bottle with food, while the cloth mother had a cheesecloth wrapped around the wires, similar to a cheesecloth that the monkeys used to sleep on. This cheesecloth was thought to provide comfort for the baby monkeys. Harlow's hypothesis was proven incorrect. When the baby monkeys were exposed to the aversive stimulus, they would run directly to the cloth mother for a sense of protection. Harlow also found that if close emotional bonds are not created at a young age, it will hinder the organism's ability to form these bonds later on in life. Psychologist Mary Ainsworth, like Harlow, studied the idea of attachment. Ainsworth had a mother and a baby placed in an unfamiliar room where the baby would be allowed to play with all the toys in the room. Also in the room was a woman unfamiliar to the baby. The mother would then leave the room, briefly leaving the baby with the unfamiliar woman before returning. A majority of the babies used in this study would happily play when their mothers were present. They explored the room and would return to their mother every now and then. When their mother returned after being gone, they would be happy to see them. These babies displayed secure attachment. Some babies displayed insecure attachment, where they would be upset when the mother left, but angry at her when she returned. These babies also showed more inconsistent behavior while in the room. I'm going to try my absolute best to get this last name right. Diana Baumrind studied how parenting styles affect the emotional growth of children. Authoritarian parents are parents who have high demands but low responsiveness to their children. These parents have very high expectations but provide very little for feedback and nurturance. Mistakes also tend to be punished quite harshly. While permissive parents tend not to set firm guidelines, if they set any at all. Considered the most effective parenting style by psychologists, the authoritative style of parenting is characterized by reasonable demands and high responsiveness. Authoritative parents can have high expectations for their children. However, these parents also give their children the resources and support they need to be successful. In 1950, Eric Erickson will publish his book, Childhood and Society, which features his well-known eight stages of social development. As a neo-Freudian, Erickson adhered to some of Freud's ideas, but focused more on social influences as a form of development. Erickson's theory on psychosocial development centers around the idea of crisis resolution. At each one of Erickson's eight stages, a crisis must be resolved. If the crisis is not resolved, the individual may lack the positive characteristics of that stage. Our first stage of psychosocial development is going to occur during infancy and is going to deal with trust versus mistrust. If the infant has a positive resolution in this stage, it produces a sense of predictability and trust in the infant's environment. However, physical and psychological neglect can lead to a feeling of mistrust in the environment. At this stage, attachment between the baby and parent occur. In toddlerhood, we move to autonomy versus doubt. In this stage, caregivers encourage independence and self-sufficiency. In this stage, if parents encourage independence and self-sufficiency, it will promote a sense of self-esteem in the toddler. If there is over-restrictive caregiving, it can lead to self-doubt in the ability of the child and result in low self-esteem. Our next stage is going to occur in early childhood and is going to deal with initiative versus guilt. If the child is given a sense of freedom to initiate activities and develop a sense of social responsibility, the child will gain self-confidence. If parents over-control the child's activity and social learning, it can promote guilt and fear of punishment. As we get into middle and late childhood, a lot of our social interactions occur outside of the home with our peers. This is when we reach the industry versus inferiority stage. Positive experiences with our parents and keeping up with our peers allow us to develop a sense of pride and confidence in our schoolwork and other social activities. Negative experiences with our parents or failure to keep up with our peers can lead to a sense of inferiority and inadequacy. 
Next up, we have our adolescence in the stage of identity versus role confusion. Taking on different roles, the adolescent starts to develop a sense of self and forms commitments to future adult roles. Apathetic adolescents, or ones who do not experience pressure or demands from others, may feel confusion about their identity or their role in society. As we move into young adulthood, we face the challenge of intimacy versus isolation. When we establish lasting and meaningful relationships with others, it allows us to develop a sense of connectedness and intimacy, which is is very important for our social development. On the other hand, if we have fear of rejection or are too preoccupied with ourselves, it may cause us to be unable to form close, meaningful relationships, which can lead to psychological isolation. Next, we have generativity versus stagnation, which occurs during middle adulthood. Through child rearing, productive work, and caring for others, the adult expresses unselfish concern for the welfare of the next generation. However, if the adult is too self-absorbed or too self-indulged, or if they're too preoccupied with their own needs, it can lead to a sense of stagnation or boredom in life. Erickson's theory is going to end with ego integrity versus despair. This occurs during late adulthood, and it basically involves the older adult taking a look back at their life. If they had positive experiences, they'll have a sense of self-acceptance and meaningfulness and be proud of their accomplishments. If they do not feel fulfilled with their life experiences, they might have a sense of regret and despair and be disappointed about their accomplishments in life, or lack thereof. You may have noticed that with each stage of psychosocial development, I paired with a life stage. These are just going to be general guidelines for someone who lives a full, healthy life. It is possible to go through and skip around different stages depending on life circumstances. For example, an individual who is terminally ill and finds out at the age of 36 might experience ego integrity versus despair. And our last topic for discussion, we have gender roles and sex differences. Sex is the biological category of male or female, as defined by physical differences in genetic composition and in reproductive anatomy and function, while gender is the cultural, social, and psychological meanings that are associated with masculinity and femininity. Gender roles refer to the behaviors attitudes, and personality traits that are designated as either masculine or feminine in a given culture. Gender identity is one's sense of being male or female. The gender schema theory combines social learning with cognition. In this theory, we have our own schemas created for genders. Children then try and identify with these schemas. Gender role stereotypes are the beliefs and expectations people hold about the typical characteristics, preferences, and behaviors of both men and women. Gender role stereotype can lead to stereotype threat, where someone is feared that they will be judged by their group if they do not share the same beliefs or interests as the group. Well, that does it for our Unit 6 review on developmental psychology. I know it was a quick one this time around. I will see you guys later. Peace. Also, before I forget, do not forget about the Unit 6 practice questions in your review packet. Complete them and check your answers to make sure you understand everything we went over. Peace number two. Bye for real this time.